You will spend most of your waking hours working in one form or another. Um, some of us work at home. Some of us toil away at an office. Some of us are skilled, uh, you know, like plumbers, electricians, and so forth. And uh, some of us own our own business. And we have a lot of variety. But in one form or another, we all will spend most of our waking hours working. And you'd think, okay, then, if that much time is spent working, God might have some words of advice. He might have some things to say about it. Um, I know we spend just as much time sleeping, but I don't think that that's the same. <laughs> well, the God of Israel does have something to say about work. Does how you approach work affect your spiritual life? Uh, does your spiritual life affect your approach to work? Or are they separate matters? Do you just keep them? Do you put them in a box over here? This is my work box, and this is my spiritual box, and I try to keep the two separate because, you know, they might conflict. What's our approach? I'd like to start off with some uh, very positive stuff. I, I think it's all positive, but some career advice from the book of Proverbs. So turn to Proverbs chapter 6, if you would. Proverbs chapter 6. We are going to take a look at some very good principles, basic principles about work. We're going to start off with Proverbs 6, which is the story of, well, it's a very short little anecdote. It's almost like a parable about the ant. Proverbs 6, verses 6 through 11. Go to the ant, you sluggard. So this is, this is you know, obviously trying to help somebody get past some not so productive behavior. Go to the sluggard, go to the ant, you sluggard, sorry. Go to the ant, you sluggard, consider its ways and be wise. So take a look at this natural phenomenon. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a thief, and scarcity like an armed man. The ant gives us a good example to follow. A person with internal motivation is what we're thinking about here. Of course, we're not trying to engage in a study of ants. We're trying to apply what we see in nature and apply it to human life. A person with internal motivation, who's kind of moves on their own steam without having to be, you know, kicked in the behind or whipped across the back. Well, if you think about it in a work environment, a person like that is a more valuable employee. All right, a more valuable employee. Whereas a person who constantly needs to be told what to do, well, they're just less valuable and they're going to be less successful. Now, some of these things might seem self-evident, but remember that we're all on different scales and um, we're all in different places. And for some people, they haven't really thought about this stuff. But let's take a look at those two, less valuable and then less successful. Well, if a manager, for example, has to constantly watch over an employee to make sure that they're actually doing what they have agreed to do and what they're supposed to do, well, then that's a drain on that manager's time, if you will. They have to spend the time watching over this other person. Now, of an employee who can be counted on to take care of what needs doing frees that manager or supervisor or perhaps the business owner or whatever, frees them up, frees up their time so that they can go somewhere else in the business and get stuff done. So if you just think of it in those very rough and raw terms, a person who is not self-motivated is just less valuable because then you have to take extra man hours to make sure that they do what they're supposed to do. Less successful. Again, some of these things should be very self-evident, but lack of internal motivation and drive 
Well, basically that shows that there's very little opportunity for advancement. Employers basically will give more money to employees with drive. Why? Well, not only because they're more valuable, but because they want to make sure that they don't lose them. Okay? So there's a reward built into the system for people who have that internal motivation. Employers will more likely give promotions to employees with drive, who move things forward on their own steam, so that they can take on greater responsibilities. Okay? And we'll actually circle back to that idea a little later. Let's go back and, and think about this, this ant. Have you, has anybody ever looked at ants on an anthill? They're amazing. They're amazing creatures. And, and we don't want to attribute too much intelligence to the ant, but it is fascinating to watch them work. Uh, what does the ant do? Well, in verse 8, we're told that the ant prepares for the future. All right? I don't, again, want to attribute too much intelligence to the ant, but if you look at the activity of the ant, whatever guides it, whatever drives the activity of the ant, is a positive example. This ant moves on opportunity, okay? When the ant sees a little, like say you drop a cookie, you know, in the lawn, you know, within a couple of hours, it's gonna be covered with ants. They jump on it. When they see opportunity, they move and they're all over it. Even if they don't feel like eating a cookie at that moment, right? Now, there's a principle there. There's a principle there to store up for future times when nothing else might be there. You might think, well, I don't feel like a cookie today, so I'm not gonna go out and do any gathering of food. I'm not gonna be building uh, you know, a shelter because it's not raining yet. Well, the principle that we see there is to prepare for the future, to work today so that tomorrow, well, we might not be able to do that work. We might not have the opportunity to gather that food, so we work today. We seize the opportunity. Let's see, in verse 9 and 10, we learn a little bit more about the ant. And it's very simple. It's basically that hard work works. It is a solution. Hard work works. It's not necessarily focusing on the ant, but the comparison is there. To the diligent ant, we're asked, how long will you lie there, you lazy person? And when will you get up from your sleep? And that sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you. To be successful requires hard work. Okay? Hard work. No employer is going to make efforts to reward a worker who is always looking for excuses and ways to get out of the task that has been given them to do. And as a result, some people end up poor and not having much. Now... With that said, there's a very important caveat I want to make here. Okay, so I want you to think about something. Saying that, making that cause and effect connection between hard work and poverty, you know, coming from not working hard, it's very important to remember that this does not mean that all poor people are lazy people. Okay, so that's a very important caveat. It's a good understanding for us to remember at all times. We shouldn't make the equation that says, well, if you're poor, therefore you're lazy. That's not what the scriptures are saying. What the scriptures are saying is, if you're lazy, you may become poor. And it's a pretty easy way to connect those ideas. But the reverse is not true. If you're poor, it doesn't mean that you're lazy, right? It's a fallacy, as much as like the idea that Job that his afflictions were the result of his sin, very similar. And people can look at it and they can get it totally wrong. Some people are just born poor. And it's through no fault of their own. It could be because of their family legacy. It could be social injustice, all kinds of different things. However, with that said, and with that caveat firmly in mind, the way out of poverty the way to escape that is hard work. And there's no other way. Well, you can dream about winning the lottery, but your chances are very, very slender that that's actually going to provide you an escape from poverty. 
the way out of poverty, regardless of how it happened, is through hard work and drive, which are actually spiritual principles that we'll come around to see. Social programs, for example, uh, they can do wonderful things in society and they can give people opportunities that they wouldn't otherwise have. But the way to make that opportunity a success is through hard work and through drive. And so that's the principle that we see in, in we'll, we'll see even more in the book of Proverbs, which is some advice that God our Father gives us about how to handle and manage our lives. In verse 11, it says that poverty will come upon you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. The consequences of our behavior, um, well, in this case, the consequence of the behavior of a, a lazy person comes upon them as a surprise. It says like a bandit or an armed robber. In other words, they were not expecting it. The Proverbs, if you, if you think about the Proverbs, and of course we're looking at work, but the Proverbs actually tackle a lot of situations in life. The Proverbs have been placed within God's word so that you may avoid such nasty surprises. Having read the Proverbs, a person who's lazy, for example, has less of an excuse to say, well, I didn't know any better. I had no idea that the, you know, this cause and effect was in place. So you can't blame me. Well, God has put the Proverbs in the scriptures for that reason, so that you know in advance, this is how it should be done. This is how to approach this matter. God's word says, <clears throat> You don't have to learn the hard way. I, God, if you will, can tell you the wise way to proceed in life. Now you see this with a very simple life principle here, like hard work gets you out of poverty or it can get you more. Um, having a proactive attitude can help you in your job. They can give you... Uh, more opportunity for advancement, more opportunity for money. But think how the same principle applies to the spiritual aspects of our lives. It's very, I think, you know, considering the people who are here in this room, I think it's very easy for us to see the connection when we talk about work, hard work, diligence, drive. I mean, it's almost so simple that I feel embarrassed telling you about this because I know you know this. But it can also be applied to spiritual principles. But we're going to stick with work for the time being. Proverbs 26, verse 16. Here the proverb, following along similar lines, says, A sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven people who answer discreetly. So you've got this lazy person, and they think they're wise. They think, well, I've got it all figured out wiser than all these other people out there. And some people, some of us, perhaps, don't see the consequences of the approach to life that we are taking. This example, a lazy person, their way seems perfectly sensible and logical to them. That is, until the moment that it isn't. Until the moment that it isn't. So again, let's consider Proverbs as an example of God's good advice. Proverbs 24, verses 30 through 34. Again, dealing with issues of work. Very practical advice here from God's word, from God himself, if you will. I went past the field of a lazy person, past the vineyard of someone who has no sense. Thorns had come up everywhere. The ground was covered with weeds and the stone wall was in ruins. I applied my heart to what I observed, so I looked at it, I thought about this, and I learned a lesson from what I saw. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a thief, and scarcity like an armed man. Another principle for us from the book of Proverbs and related to work is that we should learn from the example of others. Again, this is applicable in many, many areas of life, not just work. But we should try to recognize the cause and effect that we see at play around us. 
to learn what, in this instance, leads to success and what leads to poverty and realize that our actions have consequences. And it's, again, very easy, I hope, to see this in the working world. And let's make sure that we apply it in other areas. So you've got this person there, and they have an overgrown vineyard. They've got broken down property, and they probably think that they're the smart one because they're not working and wasting all their time fixing up this property. What difference does it make anyways? You know, if I let the wall fall down, well, that, that means that the animals can come into my yard and they can graze a little bit. And I like looking out the window at the deer. So what's the big deal? Who cares? And, you know, at first, things like that don't seem like a big deal. But then you reach a tipping point. You reach a tipping point when the unattended matters add up so that fixing them isn't even possible anymore. Say, for example, that you, you have a house. And again, this is an analogy, but say you've got a house and it needs, uh, needs some new shingles, okay? Because there's a leak and water's getting in. And you get a quote and the quote comes in and says it's gonna be $5,000 to put new shingles on your house. And uh, you might think that's a pretty good quote. <laughs> All right, well, I tried to keep it simple. <clears throat> yeah, that's a pretty good quote. If you get a quote like that, I say go for it. All right, so it's going to be $5,000 for these shingles because, you know, there's a little bit of water. But then, you know, that's a lot of money. That's $5,000. It means I have to put off some other stuff that I wanted to get done. You know, I wanted to upgrade my car, and I was hoping, you know, I could use that money and, you know, move up and uh, get a better car. So, you know, the leak, the, the, it's not affecting anything inside the house. The water's not dripping inside the house. It's kind of, you know, going, to drop, going down the wall on the outside. But, you know, so I think it can wait. It can wait. And then a few years go by, you know, because, you know, you bought this nice new car or upgraded car, and uh, you're really enjoying driving it around. You're having a good old time. And now the roof, now the roof still has this leak, but what happens is some rot gets into the wood. The rot gets into the beams that hold the roof up. Well, now you've got a problem because the roof is starting to sag and now the water is starting to come in the house and you get a quote. And the quote comes in at $50,000. Is that a good quote? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I thought you might know. All right, let's just say for sake of argument, you've got to put an entire roof with all the beams. It's going to cost you, cheap quote, $50,000. Okay, well, $5,000 and $50,000 is a big difference. $50,000, I, I can't afford that. I'm going to have to unload this house. I'm going to have to move out. Something bad is going to happen. That's an example of a tipping point where you can let something go long enough because it's not causing immediate problems. You kind of can, I can live with the consequences. You know, I can, live with, I can live with this for a while. But then it reaches a point where you realize I can't live with it. And fixing it is going to be so difficult and so, in this case, in this analogy, expensive, that's just not possible. And then you're stuck. And then you're stuck. There's a mindset. There's a, a, a well, I'll call it the lazy mindset. Very creative, I know. A lazy person, a lazy person dreams and talks, but doesn't make it happen. Dreaming and talking, but never making it happen. And now we're starting to inch into what I would consider more of the spiritual realm a little bit. But we're going to stay with work for the time being. Turn to Proverbs 14, verse 23. What does God say about work and your approach to work? All hard work brings a profit, but mere talk only to poverty. Diligent work is what makes dreams come true, not good intentions. Proverbs 13, verse 4. A sluggard's appetite is never filled, but the desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. You have to act on the desire. You want something, you have a, you know, a desire for something, you have to act. Okay? Or the, you have to act on the idea or the plan or whatever to get the good results. Dreaming and talking and thinking 
don't get you anywhere. Again, I hope this is very self-evident, but these are things that God wants, especially the young, especially young people. And, you know, for example, this is something that you would want your teenagers to think about, okay? You have to act on that. You've got to make something happen in order for it to happen. But it's a, it seems like a very simple lesson, but don't neglect reminding your young people that they have to do this, things as simple as that. If you want something to change, you have to act on it. Dreaming, thinking, moaning, sighing isn't going to make anything change. I think, you know, it's very interesting and very cool that these things come out in God's word from the book of Proverbs. Okay, Proverbs 22 verse 13 says, The sluggard says, there's a lion outside. I'll be killed in the, pu in the public square. There's a lion outside. I'll be killed on the street if I go out there. It's one of my favorite Proverbs because it's just so bizarre. But if you think about it, and some of the Proverbs are like this, where you have to really think, what in the world is he getting at? But when you, when you think about that, and then you come to the point where you realize, aha, you realize how profound that is. Because there's always a reason not to act. It's always a reason not to act. Well, I know the lawn needs to be mowed, but there could be a lion out there. So let's not take the risk. Again, it's, it's you know, kind of far out there, but that's the concept. There's always a reason not to go out. You know, I, I don't, uh, I, could, I could cut my foot if I'm mowing the lawn. There's always a reason to not do what needs to get done. Or, better, perhaps I should take that back and say, there's always a way to think of an idea why you don't need to act. Well, it's just so much easier if I don't. It'd be so much easier if I just sit back here and I think I'll have another beer. Now, there's a word that pops out in Proverbs, and it's diligent. Diligent, and you read it a lot. And I think that sometimes there are these words like diligent that just sort of float over our heads and we think, oh yeah, you know, a diligent person. You know, you think of someone scratching away in a notebook with their pencil or whatever, you know, an accountant with a, you know, little green hat on. Diligent is, of course, translated here from Hebrew. And the Hebrew word uh, literally means sharp. It means sharp, pointy. Okay? For example, I would say, it has teeth, something that has teeth in it. Uh, they might use the w word in other ways. I think one of the ways is uh, for a plow, you know, a plow that actually cuts into the soil. Let's go with teeth for the time being. It has teeth in it. The diligent mindset, when you see it applied in scripture, and we don't have time to go through all the ap applications, but one who is diligent has initiative and motivation drive, foresight, foresight, and enthusiasm. It's much more pleasant to work with someone who is enthusiastic than someone who's dragging their feet, no matter how efficient they are. I mean, I, I think you all know of situations where you've worked with someone who's actually pretty good at their job, but they're just a drag to work with because they don't have any enthusiasm whatsoever. And it's just really hard because it takes a certain amount of emotional energy to get going through the day. But a diligent person has all that and they're happy about it. Okay, the lazy person is kind of like the opposite. Now, the lazy person and the diligent might both have wishes and dreams. They both have things they want to accomplish. Okay? But the diligent is the one who acts, the one who moves on. When they see something that needs to get done, they start getting it done. The one who sinks their teeth into it, if you will. Turn to Proverbs 12, verse 24. Diligent hands will rule, but laziness ends in forced labor. Kind of takes us back to the ant, you know? The whole idea that a lazy person basically needs to have someone behind him cracking the whip all the time. A diligent person, a person with their own, like that internal engine of drive. Well, God says those are the people that are going to end up on top. They're going to end up ruling. 
Now, when you take that, uh, you know, we can take it out of the work context and we could look at God's promises and, you know, we could look at prophecy and we could look at our hope of kings and priests. I think you can see how that mindset and that way of approaching life has an effect on your potential in God's kingdom as well. We'll come around to that again. So we'll stick with, with working for the time being. Okay. The person who has the diligent mindset is usually the one who gets promoted. And there are people in this room who are in charge of others, who are supervisors, and they probably will, if you ask them, if you take them to the side, if you're wondering about, well, what's it like to work if you're a young person, and you ask them, I think they'll back that up. The diligent person is the person who gets promoted. Now, some people don't want more responsibility. They don't want to be in charge. Um, I remember we had a neighbor once, and I met them, and and she told me, no, no, she liked working on the assembly line because you know, she didn't want responsibility, okay? And some people just don't want that. And that's fine. I, don't, you know, I didn't look down on her for that. Some people just want um, to have a simple job. But diligence there would work in your favor in the sense that it provides some job security, right? Because the person who is diligent is the person you want to hang on to. So even if you're not burning with ambition, diligence is still the way to go. So we want to cultivate the trait of the diligent mindset. How? How? How can you cultivate the mindset of diligence? It's very simple. Well, actually, it's going to start simple. All right, <laughs> I shouldn't oversimplify it. It starts with a very simple premise, okay? Which is, do the best possible job that you can do in your current position. If you've been given a job low on the totem pole, do the best possible job that you can possibly do in that position. That shows others that you can handle more. Okay, And I think you'll find that when you do that, it comes. It happens. Maybe not as quickly as you want, but it does come. Don't be a dreamer who says, well, you know, if I were put in charge, wow, if they gave me that opportunity, wow, then I'd really show them what I can do. The time to show someone what you can do is in the position you're in right now. That's from God's word. Let's take a look at it. Uh, Proverbs 10, verse 4. It's a spiritual principle as well as a life principle. Proverbs 10, verse 4. Very simple start. Lazy hands make for poverty, but diligence brings wealth. I'm going to have to drop out of Proverbs and go to Ecclesiastes for the next one. But they're very they're, you know, almost the same sort of book. A book of wisdom, Ecclesiastes 9, verse 10. A scripture that I heard many, many times when I was young, and I really needed it at the time, which says, verse 10, whatever your hand finds to do, no matter where you are, all right, do it with all your might. Now, Solomon goes on here to say, because, you know, basically you get one shot at life and this is it. So wherever you are, do your best at it. So you might find yourself working in a very low, low job. You know, maybe you started at some restaurant as a dishwasher and, you know, God's advice to you is be the best dishwasher you possibly can be. I'm going to use a personal example, okay? Had a job once. Um, I worked as a film stripper, okay? It doesn't mean I, I stripped in front of cameras or anything. No, it means that I worked in a printing plant, okay? <laughs> I worked in a printing plant. And uh, I, had, I had gone to college and I had a pretty much worthless degree. I got my uh, college degree in fine art, okay? And it was very difficult to find an application for it. And uh, like a lot of people that took that route, if I didn't end up being an artist, um, <clears throat> which for various reasons I did not, I would get into the printing trade, a very common transition. And... Uh, I got this job working at a printing company where I 
stripped up the films. It used to be all done by hand before the digital age came along. And I would take film and I would get a reverse of it and I would put it on these big flats that would go on the big drums that were on the, the printers, the, 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 sorry, the, uh, yeah, the printing machines. So this was my job. <coughs> and uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was a very simple job. Okay, so it really wasn't using a lot of my mind. And it, you know, I could have looked at it and said, nah, this job is so beneath me. You know, I'm not, why, why bother putting any effort into this? Um, but uh, let me tell you, that was when I began with the church. I was in my early 20s. And uh, I got messages like this from the book of Proverbs, from the ministry. And I put it into practice. All right. Now, I'm not... I don't want you to think that I'm putting myself out here as the greatest example of, you know, the worker bee. But my exam, my experience was, yeah, this works. So anyway, so I'm a film stripper and I thought, well, you know, I'm doing the very simple stuff. And I enrolled in some night courses at the local tech college. All right. And I would go there three, about three nights a week and I would, uh, after a full day's work, I would take these courses on film stripping and uh, I got really good at it and I got very fast. So I had all this work coming in and basically I'd get my work done, eight hours of work and get it done in about three hours. And I worked with this other guy and he said, this is great, you know, because you can just sit in the dark room, close the door because you have a lock on the door in the dark room. He said, this is awesome. We can sit in here and lock the door and just, you know, Ugh. all right, because some people that's their approach to life, right? And I thought, yes, I am bored out of my brains. I am so bored. I don't want to do that. I don't want to sit in the dark room with you chewing the fat. So I went to the plant manager and I said, hey, look, um, you got any extra projects you need done? And, you know, he's like, ding. Yeah, <laughs> I sure do. And he, he hauled out some projects that he'd had kind of sitting on the side that, that uh, he had not had anyone do because they worked on the bigger presses. And so I had learned how to do this stuff and I got all this stuff and then I zinged through those. And he was very, very impressed. I, I think he was impressed with the fact that someone actually asked for extra work to do. And he asked me if I would like to be assistant plant manager. And I, at first I was just like, I have no idea. I've never even thought about it because it was all just so foreign to me. And you know, long story short, I. Uh, I took the position as the assistant plant manager. So that's, I think, an example of where you do the best you possibly can at this job that you've got, right? I never thought I would end up as a film stripper. I thought I was going to be famous, you know, a famous artist or something like that. And I ended up doing this very low level job. But I took the advice from scripture and that's how it worked for me. Now, look, I'm not guaranteeing you that this is going to work for you, but God's advice to you is to take the, take what you've got or take what you're, what you've been given and do the most you possibly can with it. Turn to Proverbs 22 and then <laughs> Proverbs 22 says in verse 29, do you see someone skilled in their work? They will serve before kings. They will not serve before officials of low rank. The principle here is, who knows where diligence will lead you? Who knows, right? Now, I mean, I didn't end up talking to the Queen of England or anything like that, but the principle was there. I ended up talking to the plant manager in that situation. And I also ended up talking to... Um, some other people, and I got some very interesting opportunities after that. But who knows where diligence will lead you? Where laziness will lead you is pretty certain, though. One final uh, principle from Proverbs, before we move on, is in chapter 24, verse 27. It says, put your outdoor work in order and get your fields ready. And after that, build your house. The setting here is a farming culture. Farming, they ranched a lot, 
grew, grew crops, and the field was the main area where they did their work. So from the field, a person would get all the food that they were going to use to keep themselves and their family alive, and where they would get all their potential wealth. A nice house to live in was something that you could build once the field started providing the food that you needed to eat, and once it started providing the money that you needed to buy the supplies. Before that, at least in that part of the world, you could live in a tent. So in that setting, a house was a place of comfort, if you will, okay? The principle, excuse me, is to get yourself set up, right? Get yourself set up with a means to earn a good living before you want to start enjoying a good living, okay? And all the stuff that goes with a good living. When you're just getting started, based on what we read there, God's advice is, when you're just getting started, uh, make do without, perhaps, all the finer things until you can afford them. God is not opposed to having nice things, by no means. But his advice to you, very practical advice, is, okay, well, just get it all set up first before you start trying to enjoy it all. Now, you might find that you'll have a lot of people saying, no, 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 I'll loan you the money. Just sign up for this credit card. That's a, not, a good, not a good way to go. God's advice to you is get set, get ready, and then at some and when you're ready, you can start enjoying the good things in life. Proverbs 25, verse 28. All this takes something that is actually very spiritual. Self-discipline. It takes self-discipline. Now we're starting to enter into the realm of how does this apply to my hopes and dreams for eternal life? and my relationship with God. All this takes self-discipline. In Proverbs 25, verse 28, we read, like a city whose walls are broken through, and broken down, is a person who lacks self-control. The principle here is to learn to control your impulses and your desires. You, know, you might want that thing right now, but you can't quite afford it. Well, control your impulse and your desire and we're asked in this uh, instance to imagine a city with defensive walls, all right, broken down. <clears throat> and that's clearly not something you see a lot of. We don't you know, have walls around our cities anymore. So how about if you think of it as your house? Okay, imagine your house without a front door. Front door is gone. Someone came, they took it off the hinges, and they removed your front door from your house, and your back door for that matter. How safe and secure do you feel in your house now? You're like that city with the broken down walls. And the principle of self-discipline is what protects you from these things coming into your life. Like debt, for example. They will come into your life if you don't have that self-discipline protecting you, like the front door or the wall around the city. And God's advice to you is self-discipline. Now let's take a look at some career advice for followers of Jesus Christ. Followers of Jesus Christ. The work that you do is a significant part of your discipleship before God. Right? Think of it in terms of the introduction where I said, you know, most of your waking hours are working. Well, work is the arena where very deep spiritual lessons are learned and put into practice. I would dare say that many of the things that we've just kind of zoomed through are actually very deep spiritual principles. They seem so mundane when they're applied to work, but that's, I think if we're getting ourselves in this work, work boxes over here and our spiritual life boxes over here, and <laughs> I don't, they don't get together ever. I keep them as separate as possible, but they're not. At work, you are learning and practicing some very, very deep spiritual principles. So your job is not in a separate compartment, isolated from your spiritual life and development. Ephesians 6, verses 5 and 8. Servants, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. 
Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart, and serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are servants or free, bond servants or free. So, approach your job as if you were working for Jesus Christ. Now, don't get crazy about it. You don't worship your employer, but approach your job as if you were working for Jesus Christ. In other words, work knowing that God is watching and taking account of what you're doing and what you're not doing. Even when the boss isn't, right? I mean, you know, me and that other guy, we could have been sitting in the dark room there, twiddling our thumbs. And uh, nowadays, I suppose we could be on Facebook. The boss had no idea we were, you know, we could do that. Maybe he did. <laughs> I don't know. But God is watching. And so what does God see when he watches you at work? What does God see when he watches you at work? The advice given in Proverbs was presented very much as stuff that you can do to succeed in life. You know, how to make money, how to, you know, get a nicer house, a promotion and stuff like that. But putting the good advice from Proverbs into practice is more than that, more than that. It's in your own best interests in many ways. The same advice is also useful for pleasing God. But gaining material wealth and so forth is not the goal that God is really interested in. I mean, he could give you all that stuff right away if he wanted to. You know, bread from heaven could rain down upon you. I'm sure, you know, $20 bills could as well. You know it doesn't happen, but it, if you acknowledge or accept God is all-powerful, can do all things, he could. But he doesn't, which is a very important point. The same advice is also useful for pleasing God, but we focus it in other ways as well. I think we should do all the things that Proverbs said. I'm not trying to take away from that. But God, what is he looking for? God, your Father, wants you to be a particular type of person. He wants you to be a particular type of person. And he's really not as focused on whether you're a dishwasher or whether you're a plant manager. He wants to know what kind of person you are. I think he'd like you to succeed and do well. And that's, that's you know, a separate and, and side track in life. But what God's really focused on is what kind of person are you becoming? And how do I see it by what you do? Are you a useful and profitable servant? Are you a diligent and conscientious member of his family? Which is the royal family of the universe. Which runs the universe. So, put your best effort forward with all diligence. Right? You'd want to be fearful of wronging your employer. And I think it should be vice versa. Uh, we want to deal with one another honestly and in a straightforward manner, being trustworthy, to work wholeheartedly, as the scriptures say, with politeness, respect, and even good cheer. Sometimes it's hard to muster up, but I can tell you from experience that you'll have a better day if you're cheerful, no matter what you're doing, even if you're washing dishes, which I have done. Okay, I have been a dishwasher and I had good days and bad days. <laughs> Some days I was not cheerful. Those were not good days. All right, Luke 17, verse 7. And we'll read through verse 10. Jesus says to them, uh, he's talking to the disciples and he says, suppose one of you has a servant and they're plowing or looking after the sheep. Will you say to the servant when he comes in from the field, well, come along now and sit down to eat? Won't, he, won't you rather say, prepare my supper, and get yourself ready, and wait on me until I eat and drink, and after that you may eat and drink? So will he thank a servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants or unprofitable servants. We have only done our duty. In God's eyes, 
the worthy servant or the uh, profitable servant is the one who goes above and beyond. Who goes above and beyond. Who doesn't just do what he's told. And in a sense, you could look at that as commandment keeping. Right? That's what you're told to do. You keep all the commandments. Well, that's what you were told to do. Anyway, you had to do all that. God wants you to do more. I think that's where you get into the realm of the fruits of the Holy Spirit, for example, which are not commanded, but that's what God is looking for. I mean, the commandments are what you're told to do. You have to do that. If you don't do that, trouble. But an unprofitable servant just does what he's told. Clearly, you know, the flip is that a profitable servant in God's eyes is one who goes above and beyond what the master expects. What are responsibilities that we might have as employees? If we're an employee, what are our responsibilities? What, what are we expected to do? Let's take a look at some of those. 1 Timothy 6, verse 1. 1 Timothy 6, verse 1. <clears throat> All who are under the yoke of service should consider their masters worthy of full respect so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. So as an employee, in God's eyes, part of your responsibility as an employee is to show respect. Luke 16, verses 10 and 11 says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with very much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? Well, the immediate takeaway there is that we should be faithful and trustworthy and not deceitful. Okay? And I think a lot of those, hopefully, we would have by virtue of keeping God's commandments. But it also brings out the principle that God finds out about how we are and what kind of people we are in small things, in the little things, like the respect. You know, I think God looks at us and says, well, if we, if we cannot find a way to respect uh, an employer, you know, who actually kind of has uh, some reason for us to fear <laughs> they can take away our paycheck. If we can't do that, how, how can God look at us and say, well, yeah, but I know if I, if I, if I resurrect them, I know they're going to respect me. How does God see you as a respectful person? What kind of character are you building? And how does God see it? That's a great example of where your work life is a very spiritual thing, and God's looking at it in, in a certain way. Uh, Matthew 24, verse 45. Again, just uh, more on the point of faithfulness. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at proper times? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. The idea is basically it's like a surprise visit. If the master shows up for a surprise visit, they should find the person, the servant, doing what they're supposed to be doing. Faithfully and in a trustworthy manner. Not hanging out in the dark room. <laughs> Titus 2, verse 9. God's word tells us, teach, speaking here to the ministry, teach servants to be subject to their masters in everything to try to please them and not to talk back to them. In other words, do what you're told. Do what you're asked to do. If you signed up for a certain job, you do it. And you don't talk back. Well, I don't feel like it today. Now you you're you know, you have your free will, and of course you can do that, but you're not going to you're not going to succeed, and God doesn't look favorably upon it. All right, first Peter two, verse eighteen. Servants, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering, because they are conscious of God. 
But how is it of your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. The principle there is you do these things, these spiritual things, even when the person you're doing it towards in, in the flesh, in this life, when they don't deserve it. They don't deserve it. How many of you ever worked for a, a, a boss who just doesn't deserve your respect? Who's a real, you know, a real pill, right? But what does God say to you? He says, do it anyway. It's a spiritual lesson and we learn it at work. All right, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 11. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 11. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and you should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you. So work and don't be lazy. Again, it just comes back to the principles we learned in Proverbs. Work hard. If you have a job, work hard. What about employers? Now, I don't know. Uh, there might be some people here who own their own business and they are employers. You might be a manager. You might be a supervisor. You might be in a position where you're in charge of others. Do you have responsibilities to others? Well, yes, you do. And uh, I think a lot of people don't spend enough time on this. I'm going to give you a few very quickly. Ephesians 6, verse 8, which I believe we read already. Um, Ephesians 6, verse 8 says, And masters, treat your servants in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. So all those characteristics for employees, if you will, are also applicable to an employer, right? Or a supervisor or a manager. And it also says here, don't threaten them. And I think that's something that's particular to someone who's in a position of authority. God's word is don't threaten. I mean, don't use your power of coercion to demand that employees do anything illegal, for example. And that comes up more often in business than, than we'd like to think, where someone might ask, well, to offer bribes to clients or sexual favors or cheap clients out of, out of money. Um, employers are also responsible for safe working conditions. To prove this one, I, I want to go back to Exodus 21, okay? Exodus 21. And this will take a little reflection, but I think if you, if you reflect on it, you'll, think, you'll see that it is applicable. If Exodus 21, verses 28 and 29, talking about a guy, he's basically a rancher, I suppose, it says if a bull gores a man or a woman to death and they stick their horn in their guts and, you know, kill them, that bull is to be stoned to death and its meat must not be eaten, but the owner of the bull will not be held responsible. If, however, the bull has had the habit of goring and the owner has been warned, but he has not kept it penned up and it kills a man or a woman, the bull is to be stoned and its owner also is to be put to death. Now, there, there are some other aspects to the, the penalty there, but the idea is that they were not providing for the safety of others. And I would imagine they owned a ranch and there were people and probably they are on the ranch because they were working and they get killed. Well, who's responsible for that? The, the employer. So... If we're in that position of a manager or supervisor, it's also part of our job to make sure that people are safe. God holds us responsible. Uh, Proverbs 22, verse 16. Not to take advantage of people lacking bargaining power. So if someone's, you know, if they're, they're weak, they're just like a lone person out there. They don't belong to a union or anything like that. It's very easy to take advantage of them and say, well, I'm going to pay you as little as possible. All right? And God, God doesn't really support that, I don't think. Not to take advantage of people who lack bargaining power with exploitive wages. Proverbs 22, verse 16 says, One who oppresses the poor to increase his wealth and who gives gifts to the rich, both come to poverty. 
And then Malachi 3, verse 5 on that. So I will come to put you on trial. I will be quick to testify against sorcerers, adulterers, and perjurers, and against those who defraud laborers of their wages, and who oppress the widows and fatherless, and deprive the foreigners among you of justice, but do not fear me. So taking advantage of people who are weak and you know they don't have any bargaining power over their you. We're also told that we should not hold back wages, but we should pay on time. You might think that doesn't happen very much, but uh, I can think of some examples in my life where people have held back money that really they should have given to me faster. Why? Because they wanted to collect the interest on it in the time being. Leviticus 19, verse 13. Do not defraud or rob your neighbor, and do not hold back the wages of a hired worker overnight. Here's one that's really, really basic. We must give them a day of rest. Deuteronomy 5, verse 14 and 15. The commandments are repeated in Deuteronomy, and they're done with a little different spin on them. Same commandment, but the reason for them is sometimes a little different. In Deuteronomy 5, verses 14 and 15, talking about the Sabbath. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God, and on it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your ox or your donkey or any of your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns, so that your male and female servants may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. And we talk about the Sabbath very often as, you know, a very spiritual thing. Yeah, we talk about it as a day of rejuvenation and so forth. But it's also put in the context of labor and work. And it's a responsibility for an employer to give a day of rest. Philemon 16. This one you might think is a little bit of a stretch, but I think it's, I think it's reasonable. Philemon, verse 16. Philemon is a very interesting letter. Some of the shortest letters are very interesting when you think, why is that in the, why is that in the Bible? Philemon is all about slaves. In that time, it would have been a bond servant, someone who was in servitude. He didn't have any way out. And he's run away, and Paul is pleading for him. And he says to the guy who, they're both church members, the guy who is the owner, the master, and the guy who's a slave. They're both church members. And Paul's words to the, the owner, who's a church member, in verse 16, he says, okay, bring this guy back. Let him come back to you. And then in verse 16, he says, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, Paul, but even dearer to you both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. I think the principle is applicable on many levels that we should treat others as if they were a brother. So if you're an employer, it's just something to think about. How do you treat people? And again, I think we've touched on some other things in the scriptures we've read, but we are to be fair and just, right? And we don't give someone more or less for reasons of uh, family or ethnicity or gender and so forth. We base it on fairness and justice. So in conclusion, in conclusion, in times of an uncertainty, and when are times ever not uncertain? <laughs> but when things are uncertain and you wonder, well, what, what's going to happen next week, next month, when... There are times of financial uncertainty. The best way to gain job security, uh, perhaps even to, to get ahead, is to take this valuable career advice from God your Father and from his word. And the application of these principles, I, I hope we've drawn out, the application of these principles are all, also deeply spiritual matters and how you approach work has a lot to do with how God sees you.